Well, good morning. When I was in middle school, like many middle schoolers, I had to take PE, I had to take gym class. And when we were in gym class, we had to line up along the side of the walls and sit in alphabetical order. And due to a cold twist of fate, I was set next between, uh, between two man giants named Chris Cook and Matt Doherty. And Matt Doherty would go on to be a state championship wrestler, and I'd like to think that I contributed to his victories as he practiced on me in middle school. I'm not bullied so much now, except for by Rodney. But back then, I was smaller. And Matt and Chris would punch me in the shoulders. And you know what's funny? They were so nice about it. I don't really know how to explain that. There was never a maliciousness. And now I realize that that's probably Stockholm Syndrome. And I probably should talk to somebody about it in my older years. But in the time, I wanted to be free from Matt and Chris. I wanted to be set free from them. And I knew that if I just grow up, if I wasn't so small, they wouldn't be picking up on, picking on me. I knew if I could just get bigger, if I could just grow up, I knew that freedom would be there for me if I could just get a little bigger. And, and everybody kind of knows that the older you get, the more you grow, the more you grow, the more freedom you have, right? It's instinctive. You know that when you're a kid, you got to do more things as you got older, right? It's why, it's why the rating system on movies is, is based on ages, right? There's G, and then there's PG, and then there's PG-13, and then there's R, which I've never seen one of those, but I've heard about them. And that's, that's kind of, we know, like maturity kind of comes as you grow up. But some of us, and I genuinely think this, I think that I mean, the evidence is that you're here on Sunday morning, and so you, I think, want to grow in Christ. You at least want to grow somehow. I don't think most of you would be in church on a Sunday morning if you didn't want to grow, if you didn't want to improve, I suppose. But a lot of us think that if we grow in Christ, we're going to miss out on something. We're going to lose something. And so we try to navigate this middle way of being like, rather than close to Christ, at least adjacent to him, while still being able to retain the things that we want to do, our autonomy. We somehow want to follow Jesus while still being autonomous. And in that way, spiritually, many of us are like rebellious adolescents. We haven't quite matured into full adulthood, even though we might be grown adults physically. So what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about how we can actually grow in Christ, how we can take those steps that we want to take to follow Jesus with our lives. We're in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. We're continuing our study of Galatians. We're, we're nearing the back half. We're in the back half now. And I want us to talk about immaturity, I want us to talk about maturity, and then I want us to talk about dependence. So first, let's talk about immaturity. Immaturity is slavery. It's slavery. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also... When we were children, we're enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. This passage is carrying over the discussion from last week. Last week, we raised the concept of the ancient guardian or the pedagogue. And this was somebody, and we don't really have a modern day equivalent for it as much. This was somebody who would oversee the, the livelihood, the inheritance, the, the estate of an underage heir. And what would happen usually in the, the Greco-Roman world is a, a Greek man would typically marry later in life and therefore have kids later in life. And so often the man would die before his child was old enough to inherit. And based on Roman law, a child was functionally a slave. He could not inherit anything. He didn't own anything. And so the will of the father 
would typically include some kind of a, of a designation for a guardian, usually a close male relative until the child reached maturity, usually, usually around 14 years of age. But in every culture, spiritual, emotional, legal maturity did not precede physical maturity. So the child would hit puberty and then would possibly be able to inherit. And what Paul is saying here, he's reminding the Galatians that in previous eras, they were under a guardianship of sorts. And he describes it in verse 3 as the elementary principles of the world. Now, there's predominantly four views on this, and they're all kind of overlapping. So I'm going to kind of conflate it into one idea, which is this. In eras previous to Christ's arrival, God uh, placed over humanity guardians, certain, certain concepts, certain ideas, ways of understanding the world, rudimentary understandings, basic remedial understanding of how the world worked. And this was supposed to be over humanity until the arrival of Christ and the arrival of the new covenant when we would begin to understand what God really has for the world. Now for the Jews, this was the law. This was the Mosaic law that was given on Mount Sinai. And this law was intended to do two things. One, it was to restrict the impact that sin had on humanity. You saw in the era before uh, the giving of the law. So back in Genesis, there's Cain and Abel, there's, there's uh, all the violence that's going on around Noah. All this wild stuff is happening in the book of Genesis. And so God gives the law to restrain sin. That's why the Ten Commandments are there. So that even though we can't keep it perfectly, we might think, well, I'm not going to actually do this because it's against the rules. Even though it doesn't restrain us completely. And that brings us to the second part. The law is also there to point out to us, to convict us, to show us that we can't actually keep this law on our own. We're not capable of obeying it. It's there to remind us that we need a savior. We need someone to rescue us. Now for the Gentiles, there was something else. They didn't have the law, but they had what Romans 2, 14 to 15 calls essentially a law unto themselves. And what this was, was this sort of moral understanding that every culture has. Pretty much every culture has legislation, has some kind of rules around similar things. Taking of a life, there are rules around that in every culture. Taking another person's property, there are rules around that. Fealty in marriage, there are rules around those things. And so every culture has those things, even though they don't have the law. And so what Paul is telling the Galatians, who were pagans, who had worshipped other deities, who were the Gentiles under this other way of understanding, was that if they did what the people from Jerusalem said, what the Judaizers said when they came up to Galatia and said, no, 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 you need to get circumcised if you're going to have a full relationship with Christ. Paul is saying, look, if you take that step of circumcision. You're not taking a step forward. You're actually returning to guardianship. You're returning to slavery. You're returning to immaturity rather than maturity. And this is what immaturity really is. Spiritual, scriptural immaturity is taking steps backwards and thinking there's steps forward. And many of us do this. Many of us do this. It's moving in one direction, thinking I've found the next big thing. I found the thing that's going to satisfy me. I found the thing that's going to make me happy. And then you wind up, eh, maybe this wasn't it. It's this pursuit of maturity without actually gaining it. Many of us experience this in childhood. Now, I know that this, this happens in other places. This would never happen here. But there's this thing called underage drinking. It's not about the alcohol. It's not about the Paps Blue Ribbon in your hand. It's about what alcohol signifies. This entree into adulthood. This is, what do we call them? What do they call them? Adult beverages. To have one means that you're grown up. How many people skipped out on uh, the, the Lion King when they bought tickets to that to go see an, uh, an R-rated movie? Because the R-rated movie signifies adulthood and maturity. 
And if you were like me growing up, who was super straight-laced and never did any of those things, because I was deathly afraid that I would get caught, not because I was more righteous, I was just terrified of being caught. You looked down on other people that did those things and you would do the mature stuff. You had like season tickets to the Windspear. <laughs> you were cool like that. But it's the same thing. You're pretending to be an adult when you're really not because adults go to the Windspear. I'm sorry to say that we have not actually escaped this. Many of us have lighted on a job or a possession or a hobby or a relationship or a set of, of political beliefs, something. And you said, this is it. This is what real maturity is, thinking this way, having this thing, doing this thing, believing this thing. This is what real maturity is. And it's just immaturity. It's just another step backward under the guise of a step forward. And it usually follows a cycle. First, there's fear. This is what the Galatians experienced. The, the Judaizers had come up from Jerusalem and they instilled in the Galatians a sense of fear. You're missing out on Christ. You're missing out on eternity because you haven't taken this one step of circumcision. You're not truly a Christian. They were playing on their fears. We have fears of missing out, fears of failure, Fears of, missing, fears of missing opportunities, fears of falling behind. We're afraid we're going to miss out on a promotion, fall back on our retirement, maybe miss opportunities. It doesn't matter. It starts with fear, and that fear leads us to course correction. Now, there's nothing wrong with course correction if it leads to maturity, but often course correction out of fear doesn't lead to more maturity. It leads to an overreaction, right? And this is what happened to the Galatians. Their course correct was to go to circumcision. Okay, then that's what we need to do. That's what we should do. So we changed jobs. We changed churches. We changed spouses, thinking that that's going to satisfy us. That's going to make us happy. That's really what we're missing. And then stage three sets in, and it's disillusionment. Now, the Galatians hadn't quite gotten there yet, but you realize that the job you got, it's still just as bad as the other job. The new church you're attending has just as many sinners as your first church did. Your new spouse, guess what? He or she's still human. And disillusionment sets in. And then you just repeat the process again and again and again and that's immaturity it's the same thing this is immaturity it's this constant enslavement to these various guardians these pedagogues on our lives this job is going to rule and reign my life this relationship is going to rule and reign my life this person is going to rule and reign my life this political belief is going to rule and reign my life and if i do these things then i will be successful i'll be happy i'll be satisfied and paul is saying to the galatians and god is saying to you today that is a step backward. It is not a step forward. It is not a step of maturity. It's a step of immaturity. Fyodor Dostoevsky uh, wrote, as only Russian really can write, something like this, uh, in his book, White Knights and Other Stories. He said this, Now it's a fairly long quote, so hang with me. For after all, you do grow up. You do outgrow your ideals, which turn to dust and ashes, which are shattered into fragments. And if you have no other life, now that's key, if you have no other life, you just have to build one up out of these fragments. And all the time, your soul is craving and longing for something else. And in vain does the dreamer rummage about in his old dreams, raking them over as though they were a heap of cinders, looking in these cinders for some spark, however tiny, to fan it into a flame so as to warm his chilled blood by it and revive in it all that he held so dear before, all that touched his heart, that made his blood course through his veins, that drew tears from his eyes, and that so splendidly deceived him. This is what we do. We go back over the same things again and again and again, piling up these cinders, piling up these ashes, and hoping that we'll be warmed by them, hoping that we'll rekindle something that we lost. And Dostoevsky points out that if you don't have something else, that will fail. Let's talk about 
what that something else is. Let's talk about having freedom through maturity. Let's talk about freedom through maturity. Verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So what Paul is doing here, he's taking a break from his really long discourse about slavery, which started in chapter 3 and will run all the way through chapter 4 to remind us how we get out of slavery. And some people think that this is a creedal statement, that's an early church creed. Other people don't think that's the case. Others think that Paul just has some really finely tuned doctrine right here. So what I want to do in either case is walk through this phrase by phrase because it's that important. Notice what he says first, in the fullness of time. This means at the right time in human history. So God is curating all of human history, all of human events. He is sovereignly orchestrating and guiding everything to reach the point, the right point, when the Savior would be able to come, when humanity would be ready to receive her deliverer. And so it says that God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Now, this is a poetic way of saying that Jesus is both God and man. In every culture in the ancient world, to call someone the son of God was to say that they were divinely connected. They were connected to God in a way, or to the gods, in a way that was beyond a normal human being. Paul, as we know from his other writings, takes this much, much further and says that Jesus is not just uh, divinely connected, he is God himself. But then he says he's born of a woman, meaning that he's fully human. And this is important. Jesus is both fully God and fully man, and he is still, to this day, fully God and fully man, and will continue to be fully God and fully man for all humanity, for all eternity. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't uh, discard his humanity. He didn't return to being a spirit. The Son of God will always be enfleshed. He'll always be human. And it says that he was born under the law so that those under the law might be redeemed. What this means is that Jesus is born under the same pedagogue, the same guardian that humanity was under. Why? So that he could keep the law perfectly, so he could obey it perfectly. And what this does is this creates two representatives for humanity. You can either be represented, represented by Adam before God, who failed, or you can be represented by Christ, who succeeded. Either one. If you choose neither, you're automatically, by default, represented by Adam. And this leads to condemnation. But to trust in Christ, to choose him as your representative before God, to choose him as your savior, to put your faith and trust in him, is to be redeemed and saved. He keeps the law perfectly. This word redeemed here also means freedom. It means to set a captive free. You are set free from enslavement. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you're freed from sin, from death, from punishment, and you're set free from being stuck in this cycle of immaturity that we find ourselves trapped in so much so that we might receive the adoption as sons. This is a really beautiful part, and I think we overlook it because we tend to conflate being set free from sin and adoption together. And they are together. They happen simultaneously. But one is a negative to a neutral stance. To be freed from sin is to go from being condemned to not being condemned, to being neutral. It's almost as if God's like, all right, see you, have a great life. But then God says, but I'm not done yet. You're now included in the family. So we go from negative to neutral to positive, a positive relationship. We're in the family of God and we are heirs along with Christ. And this is huge because in the ancient world, usually the oldest sibling, the oldest brother inherited most everything. This is why Jacob and Esau had such a big fight. They inherited everything and it was up to the older brother to decide typically how much or how little the siblings got. And so call, to call us co-heirs with Christ, guess what Paul's saying? He's saying that Jesus has inherited everything, and he has. 
All the promises that were made to to Adam, to Abraham, to Noah, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to Moses, through the prophets, all of that Jesus fulfills. He is the sole inheritor of all of the promises of God. But Jesus is an awesome older brother, and he shares the inheritance with us. His fame, his glory, his significance, his identity, his righteousness, he shares with us. He shares with us. Now our tendency, because this should change the way we think about maturity, because our tendency is to think that maturity equals freedom. And your life would bear this out, right? When you got to a certain age, you could feed yourself. Some of my parents of infants and toddlers are waiting on that. You're like, I really don't want my food to be cold anymore. While I feed you, I want you to feed yourself. And then that you can bathe yourself, which is really neat. And then you can stay home alone When mom and dad go out, and then you get a car that you can drive, and then you move out, and you live on your own. There's a lot of freedom that comes with maturity, but there's also responsibility. And some of us, we weren't ready for the responsibility. How many of us went off to college, and maybe that freshman year, we struggled real hard because we hadn't quite learned how to manage our time. We hadn't quite gotten used to being the one responsible getting up for class in the morning. We were used to mom coming in there and telling us three times to get up. We had to do our own laundry. Or how many of you got a new car when you were 16 and that car was totaled by your next birthday because you weren't ready for the responsibility to have that nice car? You see, you're not wrong. Freedom can, maturity can bring freedom, but it can also return us to slavery if we are not ready to handle it. The Bible tells us that freedom does come from maturity, but not our maturity. It comes from Christ's maturity, not ours. Many of your first tastes of freedom, let's take a quick poll, quick survey. How many of you are a younger sibling? Who are my younger siblings? That's right, good for you. Younger siblings of the world unite. We're the fun ones. But your first taste of maturity didn't come from your independence. It came from your siblings, right? So the first time you stayed home without mom and dad wasn't because you were old enough. It was because your brother or sister was old enough to watch you, right? Or the first time you got to go somewhere without mom and dad, without a grown up, was because a sibling or a friend sibling could drive a car and you went with them, right? It was in your, it was with your sibling that you got to do these things. And Christ functions as this older sibling who invites us into freedom through his maturity. And if you choose to find your own maturity, to find your own way, you will wind up in that cycle again of fear, of course correction, of disillusionment. But if you follow in the footsteps of your older brother, you will find freedom. You'll find freedom. Because if you remember as a kid growing up, Sometimes we made mistakes. Sometimes we we went off on our own. Our autonomy got us into trouble. And if you had a really good older sibling, you could go to your older sibling and be like, hey, I messed up and I need help. And if you had a really great older sibling, they would say like, okay, well, let's think through how I'll help you fix it. Like I'll help you. If you had an older sibling that was a little on the shady side, they would help you cover it up. And mom and dad would never know. And you have a pact to this day. You're like 55 and you still haven't told mom and dad because you still don't want to get in trouble. And parents, if you don't think that's going on, but if you had a really, really cool older sibling, and I'm willing to bet none of us had this, your older sibling would say, don't worry about it. I'll tell mom and dad it was my fault. And that is what Christ does for us. He goes before the father and he says, yes, I'm the older sibling, I'm the good son, I kept it perfectly, but you blame me for their mistakes. You blame me for their failings. I'll take the rap. And when you put your faith in him, the punishment's no longer there. You get to enjoy a great, amazing relationship with an older sibling, one that you've always dreamed of having, even if you were the older sibling. Maybe you always wanted one. Guess what? Christ can be yours. He's all of ours. 
You can put your faith and your trust in him. That's what he does. You get to have this beautiful relationship with the father and a beautiful relationship with an older sibling. If you're ever going to have the freedom that maturity brings, it has to be maturity found through Christ and it has to be through dependence upon him. You go to him with everything. You go to him with all your failings, all your insecurity, all your embarrassments and let him care for you. Let him forgive you. Let him offer you grace upon grace and let him represent you before the father. And this shows us what real maturity is. It's dependence. Maturity is dependence. Look at verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through Christ. Have you ever noticed how certain families have resemblances? Now, the, the obvious one is the physical resemblance, right? Certain eyebrows look the same or noses look the same. But occasionally, like families take on characteristics, right? Like you have like a musical family. Like we heard from Stephen and his daughter this morning. Like that's a family of musicians. You will never have to worry about hearing from me and my children in the same way, unless things have gone really south here. (laughs) If we're at that point, people, things have gotten bad. Different siblings, different families, like, like the Manning family. It's this family of quarterbacks. Archie was a quarterback. Peyton and Eli are quarterbacks. You've got Arch now, who I feel really bad for. Think of the weight of the world on that kid's shoulder. Not only is he a third generation, like, supposed to be a Manning, but he's also supposed to resurrect a struggling football program at Texas. Come on. Like, let's tempt. If I was him, I'd go play somewhere in Alaska. No one would ever know I existed. But that's me. You got the Bronte sisters, right? All three of them were authors, and all three of them died before they were 40. You've got the Kennedys. Robert, John, Ted, brothers. All of them incredibly influential politicians. You've got the Kardashians, who are also human. And while not the Bronte sisters, they do favor one another in other ways. And all of this makes sense, that when people follow in the footsteps, there's certain characteristics of families. And Paul is talking about a familial characteristic that's right here before us in 6 and 7. And the familial characteristics is, is this. It's dependence. It's dependence. It is relying on God the Father. That is what makes a person in the family of God really a person in the family of God. That's what makes you look like your older brother because that's what the Spirit of Christ does in us. He comes into our lives and he begins to shape us. When we put our faith in Jesus, he, uh, the Spirit of God molds us and shapes us to where we're more like our older sibling, Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, well, did Jesus depend on God? Absolutely. Notice it says, Abba, Father. Now, we have a huge misconception about Abba, Father, because there was, a, I think, a German scholar back in like either the 1970s or the 1870s who said Abba was like a, a child babbling. It was like saying Dada or Daddy. That is not accurate. Okay? We kind of latched onto it and developed it. That's not accurate. Saying Abba is kind of like a, a term of endearment, but also a term of respect. And it's something that a grown man would use. Right. So it's kind of like, how many of you call your dad Pop? Like, hey, Pop, how you doing? That's a term of affection, but it's also a term of respect, right? Dad, father, Pop. Abba. The most famous or most intense place that it's used is in Mark 14, 36, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, let this cup pass from me, Abba, Father. He's dependent. He's dependent on the Father. And that's what makes maturity. That's what gives us the family resemblance. It is dependence. It is relying on Christ. It is relying on the Father for everything. Now, I understand, uh, mostly because my wife told me, that what we're talking about is a little uh, esoteric. It's a little uh, up here in the clouds. We haven't gotten to the practical yet. So let's talk about how we can practically be dependent and grow in this maturity. One, dependence is needing other people. How many of you have really strong or had really strong toddlers, like strong-willed toddlers that want to do everything themselves? You give them a snack pack, And they're like, I can open it myself. And then what happens? They either can't get it open, and they're frustrated, or their snack pack everywhere. A lot of you believe 
that you can do something on your own when you can't. You can believe that you can live your life. You believe you can live your faith on your own. And that is a sign of immaturity in the faith. That's what that is. Because you can't handle it on your own. You need other believers. You need to be in a connect group. You need to be in a small group. You need to participate in grow over the fall and into the spring. That's why this is here. It's because we need each other. And the Spirit of God works through us to grow us into the image of our older brother. You need that. You need that. Dependence is also stretching yourself. Many of us, we're real comfortable. I am too. But Jesus calls us to stretch ourselves because the more we stretch ourselves, guess what? The more we have to rely on him. And frankly, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be uncomfortable. What I loved about Shelby's video was how uh, somebody was serving and, and brought her closer to Christ after a tragedy in her life. You could offer that to somebody else. You see around campus people with the, the PCBC Kids t-shirt on. They're stretching themselves. Will you stretch yourself too? Will you serve with kids? Will you serve uh, across our campus as like a greeter? Or will you teach a connect group? What will you do? Dependency is also prayer. If you want to know how mature you are as a Christian, how much do you pray? How rich is your prayer life? Because that is the number one way to tell how dependent you are. I talk to my parents a lot when things are going on in my life that I need their counsel and their wisdom because I trust them. When things are busy and I think I've got it under control, guess what? I don't talk to my mom and dad that much. Full confession. Sorry, Mom. You'll watch this later. When you talk to your Heavenly Father, it is a sign of dependence. Lastly, dependence is fighting the impossible. Some of us have become comfortable with some things that have been in our lives for a long time. Maybe, maybe you took that drink as an underage person and alcohol's kind of had an important place in your life, more so than it should. And you've struggled with alcohol your whole life. And you're like, well, I've just kind of made peace with it at this point. I'm functional. Or pornography, or, or the way you speak to other people. And you just kind of said, well, this is just a part of who I am. And so you've given up really trying to change. You've given up really trying to fight that sin in your life. Jesus says, well, of course you've given up. You've tried to do it on your own. Dependence is tackling the things in your life that seem daunting, that seem overwhelming, that seem like they can't be beat. Maybe it's a mental illness. Maybe it's anxiety or depression. Jesus says, let's take up the fight again. Let's go. I'm with you. Your older brother is here. I'm going to close with a story. When I was a kid, I was scared of the dark. Real scared of the dark. So much so that well into elementary school, I wouldn't sleep by myself. And my brother was well into middle school. And he never once complained, never fought, never fussed that his goofy younger brother had to share a bed with him because he was scared of the dark. There's a lot of things out there that we're scared of. But you have an older brother who's there with you. And he wants to walk beside you. And he wants you to walk beside him. Will you give him your life? Will you let him be with you? Or will you continue to pile up this bunch of ashes, trying to kindle up a life for yourself without Christ by your side? What are you doing? If we're going to grow, if we're going to be the people God has created, has created us to be, we've got to have our brother with us. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are so, so good to us, and I am grateful for you. I pray that you would bless each person in this room as they confront their need for you. And I pray that they would not leave this place without satisfying that need in you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.